Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to give you a little bit more about my background. Uh, as noted, um, I attended Fairleigh Dickinson University and received my bachelor's and master's degrees here. And they equipped me for a career as a secondary uh, school, high school math teacher. And I thoroughly enjoyed that career. Loved teaching, loved mathematics. Um, I married my college sweetheart, Elia. And when our first child was born, I sort of semi-retired from teaching. And then when our subsequent two children were born, I did retire and segue to become a stay-at-home mom. And I felt it was important to share this with you because it has absolutely nothing to do with the story I'm about to tell you. Elia also received his two degrees at Fairleigh Dickinson University. He was trained as an accountant. He went on for an MBA and uh, very, very well supplied his uh, needs for a very successful career as a forensic accountant. Forensic accounting is a, uh, the nature of it. Uh, required that he travel all around the world. And at the point where we had been married for 20 years, our three children were 13, 10, and 7 years old in 1988. Elia was finishing up a short trip to Europe for business, and he actually finished up a day earlier than he had expected he would. He uh, went from Frankfurt, Germany, caught a flight uh, in uh, Heathrow, London, and boarded Pan Am Flight 103. And that flight was blown up by a terrorist bomb on December 21st, 1988. Everyone on board was killed, plus 11 people on the ground in Lockerbie, Scotland. And uh, there were 270 victims in all. That was a life-changing and life-defining moment, certainly, for me. I never would have expected the paths that lay ahead of me after that. Um, I certainly had not been educated to follow those paths. And I also never realized the potential that everything that happened after 1988 would serve me later. Eventually, all of us experienced the loss of a loved one grandparents, aunts, uncles. Um, those griefs, griefs uh, are private. We usually turn to family and friends for support and understanding and love. Uh, and sometimes professional counseling can help. Um, but I have to say that losing a loved one to terrorism has other dynamics. First of all, it is a very public loss. It's a murder. And as much as you try to grieve within your home, your four walls, with your family, as soon as you step out the door, back in 1988, it was all over the media. Maybe not the internet, but it was all over the television, all over print media. And I knew that once my children went back to school, they would have to face the chatter in the classroom and on the playground. And I even remember uh, when I would be grocery shopping, there would be people who would see me and actually run in the opposite direction because they just didn't know what to say. Um, there were also very few resources to, co to counsel those who had lost uh, a loved one to terrorism. So it was only natural that the families of Pan Am 103 who lost a loved one turned to each other for support and understanding. Um, I was uh, about two weeks after the bombing, got a phone call from a woman who happened to live in the very next town to mine. And she said, Mary Kay, I read your husband's obituary. My husband was also on Pan Am 103. Her name is Mary Lou. And we bonded instantaneously and had so many things in common, not have, having ever known one another prior to this. We had come through marriages of 20 years or more. We each had three children, two daughters and a son. Our husbands were businessmen. And we lived so close to each other that we became an instant bond and a support for each other. 
We called each other on the phone, alternating, um, I would say, up until this week. We are uh, extremely close and our support system for each other. Thirteen years later, September 11th, 2001, the terrorist attack that happened to us here on our soil. The terrorist attack from Pan Am 103, on Pan Am 103, was it an attack against the United States. It, we were targeted. It just didn't happen on our soil. But September 11th brought it home. Um, Mary Lou and I realized that when this unfolded on that day, we knew there were going to be many others left having lost a loved one to terrorism. People started calling us who had known us for those intervening 13 years, knowing how we had come through this with our children, knowing how we had coped. We started, uh, they started saying, well, could you please call this family? They've lost someone. Uh, could I have someone call you? And so we, we did. We opened up ourselves to that. And by word of mouth, we decided we would open our doors as well. And by the end of September, we had about 30 people gathered in my family room. There were many losses in that room. Parents had lost an adult child. Siblings had a loss. There were widowers and widows. And Mary Lou and I realized that we could best help the widows from our experience. So we encouraged those who had um, other losses seek a support group of a like loss. And they did, and so our group was distilled down to about 20 widows. And we met every week. Mary Lou and I alternated our homes, and we uh, encouraged them to come in and just share whatever they wanted to share. We didn't want to hold court and pontificate. We would answer questions as we were asked, but we wanted them to talk. We started out with tissue boxes and name tags. And Eventually, over time, meeting every single week, more and more would come out about their husbands, where they were, what their last words were. Um, and they were able to ask us questions that they couldn't turn to perhaps normal avenues of support, their own families. Questions like, do you have a funeral if you don't have a body? Do you have a funeral if you have part of a body? How do you get a death certificate? What do I tell my children so as to not scare them? There were a lot of questions, and we could offer what worked for us. One of the uh, uh, times that I was, I was asked questions about what about my children and so on, I, I referred to the fact that losing a loved one by terrorism is a very public loss. And five years after our first meeting, one of the widows came back to me and said, I'll never forget what you said. And I wondered which, which uh, sentence I had uh, told her. And she said, it was giving me the heads up about the very public nature of this kind of a loss. I'd like you to just take a look at this graphic here. The Pan Am 103 nose cone is usually the graphic that you see projected whenever Pan Am 103 is in the news. Um, in the last few years, now we're 24 and a half years after that happened, the past four years, the one bomber who was indicted and convicted was released from prison in Scotland. That was four years ago. He died last year. We all know that Gaddafi was assassinated. That picture is what comes up on the screen. That's the public image of Pan Am 103. But the private image for me, my husband was in seat 1A. That's where his body was found. So my private loss is made very public. The Twin Towers. The image is iconic. The plane is flying into the, the uh, building. That's the public image that we see so often. But to my 9-11 widows, that plane is heading for the very floor where their husband took their last breath. A very personal grief made very public. So in their networking, uh, they uh, were able to um, bond, and we were looking for that. We were hoping that they would, in fact, bond. Um, 
the, they understood the global nature of, of what they were going through as we did with Pan Am 103. In Pan Am 103, we had uh, two avenues of legalism that we had to pursue. We had the actual willful negligence of Pan Am's faulty security that allowed the bomb to get on the plane, and that was taken to court, and they were proven willfully negligent. Um, I went to the court proceedings when I could, trying to absorb aviation law and understanding all the players involved in that. It was a new education for me, for sure. One of those paths that I had not been prepared for prior. On a global level, uh, Pan Am 103 uh, was in the, the middle of many uh, suppositions on who planted the bomb, who ordered this, who paid for it, and players from all over the world, from Libya to Malta to Germany to the Middle East, and names that I had to learn how to pronounce uh, became my new education. And even the um, trial for the two who were accused was held on neutral territory in the Netherlands but under Scottish law because the plane came down in Scotland. Another whole avenue of learning that was in front of me. Um, the World Trade Center widows were facing very similar uh, situations. They needed to explore the legalities of to sue, not to sue, and that was ever present in their minds. And of course, on a global nature, the vast network behind these bombings. Um, they needed validations of their anger. Um, and I think that our group, as we met every week, I think for the first five or six years, every week we met together. We gave them a forum to evolve, to move on, to ask questions. Actually, in a very simple way, we gave them a forum to cry and to laugh. And that was so important to them. Their lives have moved on. Uh, several have remarried, and I've been fortunate enough to go to their weddings. They've had children with their new husbands. Others raising their children through college educations, and I know what a, an accomplishment that is for the single moms doing that. Um, and it was at even one point where my daughter bonded with um, another one of the daughters of, of the widow in my group. Um, one anecdote I'd like to share with you was one evening the group was meeting in my family room and um, my son was home from college. He had graduated college. He was about to do a master's degree, but he was in and out of the house. And he came in, realizing we were meeting, he came into the family room and he introduced himself and said hello to them and respectfully uh, asked to be excused and went up to his room. And there was a, a woman in there who had a 10-year-old son. And that was the age that my son was when he lost his dad. And this woman came up to me at the end of the evening with tears coming down her cheeks saying, my son is going to make it. So all she needed to do was to see my son and that helped her move forward. Um, I was, uh, my friend Mary Lou and I were uh, familiar with a fellow who was teaching at Seton Hall University. He was teaching prospective social workers who wanted to do counseling. And he said, there's no way that I can, with all the letters after my name, impart knowledge that you two have to these prospective counselors. So he invited us to come and speak to his class at Seton Hall. And when we told our story, the Q&A line was out the door, learning experience. A producer of Nightline got wind of what we were doing and produced a piece. She first asked permission to sit in on our sessions together and then filmed it. And uh, I remember distinctly uh, that when it was shown, the voiceover at the end, the commentary, the gentleman said, well, Mary Lou and Mary Kay were hoping that if any two of the women in this group could form a bond as we had, they would have accomplished something. And his last words were, and they did. And that was very um, encouraging for us. Um, just this past 12th anniversary of 9-11, I sent out an email to the gals in my group. We're still in touch by email. We usually get together now maybe once a month, sometimes in our homes, sometimes we go out for dinner. 
in the beginning, going out for dinner and going out into a public place where everybody felt like they were being stared at was not an option. But we have progressed to that now. And I sent this email out basically wanting to know where and when the memorial services were to be held for their towns that Mary Lou and I wanted to try to attend some of them just to be there for them. And besides sending back an email with that information in it, uh, I was kind of bowled over by some of the other messages that they were imparting. And they took a, 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 the opportunity at that time, and I, I have to read some of these. They started thanking us for, now this is 12 years hence, for our amazing continuous support, our compassion and strength. They could have never made it this far without the love and support of Mary Lou and Mary Kay. But, and here's what really caught me, we couldn't have made it without each other. We've given to one another support, love, and strength. Tragedy brought us all together, but friendship keeps our hearts in touch. We really did achieve something there. We achieved that bond that they could support one another. Important lesson, I believe, that I've learned from this is that even though what I experienced in losing my husband to terrorism was a horrible experience and challenging, nonetheless, it was an education. Again, I never realized the potential that I was building in those years between 1988 and 2001. The potential of everything that came my way that I could eventually use. My advice would be, never throw away your bad experiences in your life. They're part of your portfolio. Keep them in your rear view mirror. They have potential, and you may be able to use them to help somebody else. I learned that my faith was shaken, but not broken. And I may question God's plan in all of this, but I am okay with not having those answers right now in this life. I certainly had not been formally educated to do the work that I've done in bringing these women to the point they are today. Um, my new education in learning to offer empathy and understanding and compassion and ver verifying their feelings, validating their feelings was uh, hard won, hard learned, but I'm glad I could use it to do good. Thank you.